Regina Naloga, Dinai School, to be in your company handling conflict-related sexual violence cases. Now, many of you have had sexual violence. Come November, of course, we'll have the Activism Month about sexual violence. But then again, it comes down to the fact that this was widespread and pervasive during the two-decade armed conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army and the government of Uganda, the LRA, the National Resistance Army, and the Uganda People's Defense Forces systematically targeted women, girls, boys, and men. And the pattern of CRSV committed by the LRA involved a systematic abduction of women and girls. Many of you are familiar with those stories, uh, primarily between the ages of 10 to 18 years of age. This was followed by forced marriages, forced rape, and forced pregnancies, often leading to then forced childbearing. Um, some were not even able to live through childbearing. Either they lost their lives or they lost the lives of those children. Boys and men also suffered sexual violence, including sexual uh, mutilation, genital torture, male castration, forced masturbation, and other serious sexual arms, harms. Uh, the LRA commanders also forced abducted men and boys to participate in sexual violence against female abductees, and that is definitely absurd. It's not something you want to picture in your mind today in an era such as this. So it's, it's estimated that almost 25,000 young men and girls were systematically abducted by the LRA and forced into bush marriages or even sexual slavery, resulting in thousands of children born of war time rep. A study calling on the Ugandan government to implement comprehensive uh, reparations programs for survivors of conflict-related sexual violence is yet to be released and we do have Sarah Kasande who's the head of office ICTG that is going to be talking to us about this particular case study. Good morning to you Sarah. Good morning. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Now uh, we want to first understand why the focus in 2022 on the conflict-related sexual violence? Thank you, that's a very good question. As you've already highlighted, sexual violence has devastating impacts on its victims. And uh, despite the lapse of time, these impacts endure for decades. So the conflict in Northern Uganda, as you've highlighted, was characterized by gruesome acts of sexual violence. 15 years after the end of this conflict, survivors and victims of these crimes continue to live with enduring legacies of these abuses, which have affected them physically, mentally, socioeconomically, and therefore, despite the lapse of time, there's still an urgent need to repair the harms that these victims endured so that they can live meaningful and productive lives as citizens of this country and have their dignity upheld. Okay, so the shot of it is that if a young boy was taken in by the LRA and inducted into some of these uh, sexual violations, uh, they get to then grow up knowing that that's okay, I can't rep my sister, I can't rep the girl in the community, and no one should be able to touch me. And then that child, uh, that girl is repped, and they give birth to a child who then has to go through also the same process. Indeed, there are social, community, and also intergenerational impacts of sexual violence. So we have many young boys and girls who were born as a result of wartime rape, who are now adults, a number of them, as we know the lapse of time, but they continue to live with that legacy, the haunt that they were born as a result of a gruesome experience, but also the community resentment and rejection that hampers their integration. But most significantly, the, the victims of sexual violence themselves and who are mainly women and girls, um, and your horrible experiences at a personal level, as I highlighted, the complications, the mental health, the physical complications that endure, the, so, the social rejection that they continue to experience, either because of uh, the stigma associated with sexual violence or the fact that they were abducted. So there are uh, social but also intergenerational consequences of this that need to be addressed if we expect to have a community in which all persons' rights and dignity is upheld. Well, repelled. it's coming close to two decades uh, since this happened. So the big question is, why is it important at this time yes. to un have this study undertaken? 
It is important at this time because, as I noted, that the the fact that the war ended, the conflict ended, the, the effects of the harms that victims suffered as a result of sexual violence endure. So we conducted this study, the International Center for Transitional Justice, the organization that I work for, together with the Women's Advocacy Network and the Global Survivor Fund, conducted this study primarily to assess the reparative justice needs of victims. And what do I mean by this? What needs to be done to help victims move from that that situation of despair, heart, and pain to a process of healing and full reintegration and rights into their communities. And also we thought it was important to assess what do victims want? What are their expectations for reparations? What forms of reparations should government put in place? And then finally get concrete, specific, context-specific recommendations at both a policy uh, level that the government of Uganda can implement to take this process forward. And we must lord the government of Uganda for adopting the National Transitional Justice Policy in 2019, which sets up a framework for providing reparations as well. And we thought it was timely that rest on survivor experiences, the government gets information and recommendations that will help put in place effective reparations programs for victims. Could you share with us some statistical key findings in this study? So um, uh, it was not purely empirical in that sense, but as we highlighted, we found that at least 10,000 households in the Choli region alone had at least one or two survivors of sexual violence. So, and that sexual violence, not just only in the Choli region, but across the entire spectrum of northern Uganda, from the Teso, Lango, and uh, West Nile region, although Acholi was the epicenter, as we know, of the conflict. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what are reparations and why are they important? How is government responding to some of these survivors today? Okay. Reparations are basically a, a right uh, provided for under the law and under international human rights instruments. At a very basic level, our constitution in Article 50 stipulates that if your rights are violated, then you have a right to a remedy. Remedy intends to repair. So the government of Uganda, as I have just noted, adopted the National Transitional Justice Policy in 2019. This draws from the commitments that the government made during the due peace negotiations, the, that agreement on accountability and reconciliation in which government had committed to put in place measures that would deliver justice to victims and repair the harms that uh, they have endured. Now, while the policy has been adopted, there's really been very limited progress in fully uh, delivering redress to victims. And that's why we see that uh, the effects of the violations that victims endure continue to get amplified. And that's why this report for us is critical call in calling upon government to demonstrate that yes we are witnessing peace in northern Uganda. We're witnessing development in northern Uganda. However, people who endure ter these terrible crimes continue to live with these effects, and you cannot get the full involvement of all citizens if these harms are not repaired. Okay. All right. So you do have justices that are needed for <laughs> this to actually be corrected. Yes. However, uh, people may have the fear that justice will require evidence. 15 years ago is a long time for you to start pinning anyone. And and then also the stigma and the fear for their own dear life that they mm. survived up to death yes. uh, for them to seek the kind of justice that you're talking about. So away from that coming to a reality for them, how then would you recommend the survivors of this war actually be supported? Yes. So when we talk about justice within the framework of transitional justice, it is broader than prosecutorial justice. Of course, we acknowledge and we emphasize in the report that the government should strengthen accountability mechanisms, effective gender sensitive approaches to investigating and prosecuting these sexual crimes, putting in place appropriate witness protection measures and measures that encourage victims to come forward in a manner that does not undermine their privacy and does not subject them to stigma. But also importantly, we call for a gender neutral approach because as we know, our current penal code only looks at sexual violence in the sense that it is inflicted against women and girls. But our report highlights that men and boys are also survivors of sexual violence. Now, when we talk about other forms of justice, we look at other more holistic approaches and reparations look at administrative processes. For example, providing medical care and psychosocial support, 
protection, reproductive health services to survivors who have these long-term needs as a result of the harms that they suffered, providing um, basic financial compensation to survivors, especially those who have uh, physical disabilities resulting from the abuse and are unable to engage in any livelihood or income generating activity. We also talk about land and shelter. One of the key challenges that uh, survival of sexual violence in northern Uganda experience is stigma and rejection by their communities um, because of what happened to them but also because of their affiliation with the LRA commanders. So stigma and discrimination really if affect their ability to in, to participate in community affairs and even have uh, uh, income generating uh, sources. Also, so while we wait for government to actually you know make reality the support systems that you're recommending, there's yeah. the community around these people. Um, yes. There's the regional leaderships. There's yes. um, members of parliament representation yes. of these regions that are greatly affected yes. by the post-war trauma. Yeah. Uh, in regards to dealing with this and mitigating with it, is there yeah. some that those other people in these communities can do to create an aiding environment, an enabling environment for these survivors to become better. Absolutely. The community has a primary responsibility in this. And first and foremost is the awareness of the impact of sexual violence and this understanding how it continues to impact the victims and survivors. Creating an enabling environment for survivors to feel welcome back into the communities. As noted, most of the survivors were abducted and spent some eight to seven years in captivity in the bush, living under horrendous experience. So having that environment where they are welcome with their children and are supported, that is critical. We've been working closely with local governments to see how can survivors benefit from these local government programs. We recently had government talking about parish development model. We've had different programs being implemented at local government, which are aimed at uplifting the livelihood and economic well-being of uh, citizens. So survivors should be supported to be part of this in a trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive manner that addresses uh, stigma. Another example um, uh, is aspect in terms of their children themselves, the children who are born of wartime rape. Uh, our work has revealed that they face challenges getting identification documents because they are unable to trace their origin, their fathers, their mothers at times. So communities can support address these gaps and facilitate acceptance and integration of the survivors. Now, th they need trauma-sensitive environments. Yes. However, the people that are there to give that to them are not aware of how to then deliver those kind of environments for them hmm. or rehabilitation programs for them. So then, do you have a recommendation in your study that also covers those people, the community, the local leaders, uh, the people that to them to also receive that kind of training sensitization to then pass it on to the survivors. Absolutely. We, we include that. We look at how community leaders could be engaged. But we also acknowledge that there are a number of civil society organizations that are doing incredible work to provide trauma support to, to communities. Uh, organizations like the Refugee Law Project and uh, Af uh, INET are implementing extensive programs on physical and psychosocial rehabilitation. But what we're calling upon is for government in, the, in those health centers, health center three, especially in a community community that has endured war conflict. Make sure that each center is equipped with a counselor or someone equipped to provide psychosocial support. The community liaison... And make it compulsory, uh, because here in Uganda, they will put the counselor there, the counselor will be paid money, but people will not be going to the counselor. Again, because of the stigma, how do they see me walking into the room of the counselor? Rather than make it compulsory, create an environment that is safe and conducive where people feel that if I walk in here and talk about the mental health challenges or the physical challenges that I'm enduring as a result of the conflict I suffered, I will be assisted, I will be supported. So creating that enabling environment, but also importantly, resourcing them. So the report here calls about a budget allocation for reparations programs. And we're not talking significant. The Ministry of Health, for example, can earmark specific uh, budget line that looks at trauma counseling and psychosocial support or rehabilitation in post-conflict areas, specifically targeting survivors of sexual violence and other victims who endured uh, terrible harms. Okay, all right. Um, I know that one uh, from some of the victims that participated in this study, uh, they are calling for acknowledgement of what happened yes. to them by government, but also calling for 
an official apology. Yes. Is this that is possible. This is something that, uh, I, and it's not just uh, survivors of conflict related sexual violence. Most victims in northern Uganda would like the government to acknowledge that. They, are, they suffered the most horrific harms and that the government failed to protect them. That's their position. And beyond financial compensation, they just want that recognition that we as citizens of this country endured the most horrific experiences. Our government failed to shield us from this. And I'll give an example. We, may, we had of uh, Dominic Congwen, who was recently convicted at the International Criminal Court. Here's an example. Regardless of the crimes that he committed, a 10-year-old boy going to school, abducted on his way to school, taken and spent 10 years years or over, actually for him he spent decades in captivity. There are, thousands, there are hundreds of victims of that nature in northern Uganda and all they want is the recognition that what happened to them shouldn't have happened and the government recognizes this and is taking steps to remedy what happened. Okay, I'm trying to picture the image of government coming through with that official apology. I think so the fact that they've adopted the national yeah. transition of justice policy is a step towards that. That's and I think the president has in a number of instances, uh, I think in relation to Mukura, but mostly in relation to atrocities committed by the NRA, said there were wrong elements and this shouldn't have happened. But victims want to go further and say, for the NRA, we were not protected. I know an apology goes a long way in yeah. healing a yeah. broken heart. Now, yeah. away from that, I know that you're launching the study this yes. morning. Tell us about the launch of the study. Yes, so we are launching the study tomorrow, this morning at uh, Mestil Hotel. We will be sharing the findings of the study and the recommendations. Again, as I noted, our aim is to try and see how uh, this can contribute to policy making and the implementation of the National Transitional Justice Policy. The study was conducted in a manner that is anchored in what we call co-creation. Usually researchers are based where a researcher goes to the field, picks information, prepares a report. But this was a survivor-led process whereby ICTJ working with the Women's Advocacy Network, a network that's comprised of 500 survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, designed this study and designed the approach in which to identify what needs to be prioritized and what recommendations should be shared. So we'll be launching it at Mestil Hotel in a few hours now and then we'll also be having a launch um, in Lira two days from now. All right, so after the launch, what then follows? After the launch, we will continue engaging the Ministry of Justice, the Governance and Security Program, as to implement the, the recommendations. There are specific recommendations that target different institutions. For example, recommendations targeting the Ministry of Health, looking at how can you anchor sexual reproductive health programs that specifically target survivors. So, um, how do you um, uh, provide psychosocial support to survivors? There are recommendations that target NIRA, the National Identification and Registration Authority. How do you create exemptions so that that child who was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo or Central African Republic can get a national ID, even if that child cannot trace their clan, their father's name, because of the circumstances they were Ugandan, born? So, yes. yes, but they are Ugandan. So very concrete recommendations that we intend to work with policymakers, uh, civil society actors, and also with uh, religious and traditional leaders see that uh, remedies are available to them. Teams. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Your you. parting shots? Um, my parting sh th shots are that uh, we're thrilled, we're excited to be launching this study, and we at the International Center for Transitional Justice are committed to working with the government and all different stakeholders to see that all citizens and all people in this country who suffered grave violations of human rights, especially survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, have access to redress as guaranteed in our Constitution. Well, um, Michael Jackson once sung, we are the world, we are the children, we are the ones to make a better place. So let's start living that today. And so for those that have been affected by the conflict-related sexual violence, uh, it's our time, time now to actually cause justice to be extended to them, uh, but more so acknowledgement of what they went through and that government should have done better at that time. Uh, they are calling for an official apology from government and I hope that that comes through because at the end of the day, what does it benefit for the government to extend public services, uh, to extend perfect infrastructure to these regions, especially the ones that were affected by the LRA, if they're not actually also dealing with the broken hearts, the 
bleeding hearts of the people that are in these regions. And if you deal with the heart, if you clear the heart, uh, then you can allow these people enjoy what you're delivering to them as government. So that is the call at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank and you And I very trust much. that th this has caused you to look a little bit deeper and reflect uh, on the things that surround us. We do have the Kickstarter Computer Misuse Act. We need to understand it, lest some of you fall on the wrong side of the law. One of these days, Chrissy Genyu coming up with that. Thank you so much.